Good morning and welcome to Impact Discipleship. There you go. Yes, back here on a Saturday morning after Josh taught last week. And uh, we're going to head back into our studies of 2 Thessalonians. It's a short book, short letter. It's only three chapters. It's probably, if I'm guessing, only going to take us four, four teachings to get through it. Today we'll cover the first 12 verses of chapter 2. Uh, we'll cover the rest of chapter 2 next time I teach, and I think we could do all of chapter 3 probably in one uh, setting, not too much doctrine there. But here we are in chapter 2, and here's where we start getting into the main gist of why he wrote this letter. Remember, this, is a, this letter was written to uh, correct some misunderstandings from his visit and his first letter. And we're on the strain, we're, we're going to stay in this, um, the same line of thinking. Lots of what's going on here, the real context of the first letter and the second letter is all about the end of the age, all about the second coming of the Lord, all about how that relates to the persecution they're facing uh, while they're waiting. And we know that the, uh, the, the reason he wrote the second letter is because for some reason between the first and second letter, they thought the day of the Lord happened and yet they still were being persecuted. Mm. And, they, and they knew from his teaching, how could that be? Because this can't be, this can't be it. Because I think uh, the, we're supposed to be vindicated when the Lord returns, whatever. So that's the problem going on. Here, we're going to turn our attention a little more towards um, some specific details about the end of the age, specifically the Antichrist. So he's going to make some uh, some teaching. So we're going to try to put these pieces together. We'll begin here in 2 Thessalonians. Of course, we'll see a little bit of Revelation, a little bit of Daniel, and a whole lot of Matthew 24, which is something we spent lots of time on when we were in the first letter, because he's talking about the end of the age. And of course, something we spent a tremendous amount of time on last year when we actually went through the entire Gospel of Matthew. So there'll be lots of references to other sermons as we... As we um, get through here. We're going to start off with the first four verses. Uh, whoever has their Bible open has got a nice voice. We're outside today. The weather in South Florida, for all you who are not in South Florida listening, January 27th, and it's probably around 78 degrees. It is just glorious. And here we are. 80 degrees on my thing. 80 degrees in January. Outdoors and shorts on. So if you're freezing somewhere in this country, ha! <laughs> anyway, um, let's read the first four verses. Who's got that? You, Josh? I got or, it. Go ahead. Paul, Savannah, and Timothy to the church of Thessalonians in. Nope. nope. Second. Chapter, chapter two. two. Oh, chapter two, we're on. Second Thessalonians 2. Oh, yes. Okay. Now, brethren, there you go. concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as through the day of Christ, had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember right. that when I was still That's with it. you? That's it. Okay. The first four verses, right? Okay. Yeah. There you go. We're gonna get to that next. Right. So you get the context here. He's talking about um, he's reminding them, hey, don't don't be fooled like this thing happened already. That's really the context. Then he's, then he's going to start saying, because you have to see certain things first. If I could give you one main kind of cha-ching takeaway here, is that there are prerequisites to the return of Christ. Things have to happen first. Right? It's like you can't go into college, you know, year one and say, um, you know, I'm getting my master's degree. It's like, no, you got to get your bachelor's before you get your master's. Things have to happen first. And he's going to say, these are the things that have to happen, right? And he's saying, he's talking about big ticket item, which is very controversial 
when you think of the end of the age in the church, lots of controversy. And he says it right here in, in, in the beginning verses, concerning the coming of the Lord and the gathering of us together to him. The second coming and the rapture. That's what this is talking about. Mm -hmm. Most of the church today would say those are two different events. These are two different events. Now, we in detail studied this when we were in the first letter. We're going to review some of those details today because it's essential you understand uh, how all the books have to fit together for you to come to the right conclusion. So he says, don't be, don't be shaken um, as if we're agreeing with this, mm -hmm. like it already happened, right? As though the day of the Christ had come. That is those eight words encapsulate the overarching purpose of him writing this second letter. And for those of you listening online, or even those live here, um, if you go back to the last teaching, our first teaching, where we taught the whole chapter one, called Manifest Evidence, it focused on why half the teaching was just an introduction to the letter, which was, why did he write this letter in the first place? And if you're, if you're watching online, or if you print the notes, the beautiful thing about the notes online is there's hyperlinks to everything. So if I say, go look at this teaching, click on the blue link, it'll take you right to that teaching. Um, and this is the reason he followed up the first letter so quickly with the second letter to these who I would call durable disciples. They were being persecuted. They were withstanding persecution, even though in this little season they thought, this shouldn't still be happening because didn't the day of the Lord happen? And yet they were still enduring. And, um, and he was really commending them. Uh, and their concern, as we learn in that letter, was not so much that they missed the day of the Lord. It's that they missed this idea of, I thought when the day of the Lord came, we wouldn't be persecuted anymore. Right? And of course, he's saying, you didn't miss it. You won't be, and you didn't miss it because it didn't happen. Yeah. Right? That's really what he's saying. Right. Right? And he assures them, that sure they will be, uh, in fact, vindicated. God's people will be vindicated in the end. And then he mentions in the gathering together to him. And this is where he reiterates the second coming of the Lord and how it coincides with the rapture. Now, somebody else can go back, in all fairness, and say, that verse says this and this, as if it's two things together, right? Now, you could argue, he's talking about two different things, well, yes, it are two different things. But you could argue that they're not happening at the same time. But I will tell you, if we, if we put all the pieces together from other areas of the Bible, you'll see that it is all happening at the same time. And that his teaching here is consistent with these other letters. Like we're going to see that the, you know, in the book of Revelation, which highlights the recorded events of the last seven years on earth, and how the rapture takes place at the last trumpet. And when you see this in the book of Revelation, you see the order. You see seals, trumpets, bowls of wrath. And the wrath of God is what Christians are not subjected to. And right there at the seventh trumpet, before the first bowl, is when the rapture takes place. It's, it, it's, it should seem pretty obvious. We're going to do it again. We'll go into the book of Revelation. When I say obvious, once you understand how the book of Revelation is laid out, it's obvious. Otherwise, it looks really confusing because he says, and this is about to happen, and then you don't see it happen for three chapters. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there's a big parenthesis in between where he gives you a bunch of details, and you're like, but it happened here or did it happen here? Well, this is talking about, you can't see my hands on the camera right now, but you know, if, you, if, you, if I move my left hand up in the air, it happens over here, and my right hand up, up in the air, and says it happens here. It's everything that happens in between. It's like a parenthesis. And you have to be able to see that in the book of Revelation, where it's like, you know, it'd be like t me telling my wife, I'm about to give you a kiss. And then we talk about what the kiss is going to be like, and we talk about how we met, and talk about our first kiss, and then I give her a kiss, right? And they're separated by this, this parentheses, but the introduction was talking about the thing that took place. And I remember, it might be three chapters later that the, the wrath, and the bowls of wrath have come, but they haven't because they really start here. And then you see all these things in between, right? Mm -hmm. So we're gonna, we're gonna see that again today. Um, and how this is also consistent with the end days discourse that Yeshua preached in Matthew 24 and 25, the Olivet Discourse on the Mount of Olives, which begins with the disciples asking him 
the question. Tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age. <coughs> so in Matthew 24, 3, he, they asked that question. And the entirety of that chapter is him answering that question. Unfortunately, for many readers, if you're not sophisticated, Yeshua does the same thing that John does. He gives a message that has, in many places, a linear understanding, step by step by step, but then there's parentheses in between. By the way, doesn't the book of Genesis do that? We see creation happen almost, you see it almost happen twice, yeah. right? That's not an uncommon technique in the Bible. It does make it a little difficult. Um, but if you are interested in a full discourse on the Matthew 24 and 25 teaching, just click in the notes on a message when we were in there last year called Prophetic Education, and you can go line by line through the entire thing. Um, and if you're interested in another detailed teaching on the rapture itself, when we did 1 Thessalonians 4 back a few months ago or some weeks ago, uh, verses 13 to 18, it was called Caught Up Together. The whole thing was on the rapture and the timing of the rapture because that's what it's talking about in First Thessalonians, the first letter, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so you can see that. What I want to do here is um, as we move on to verse two, um, chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, and he says, let no one deceive you, and then he starts telling us a few of the prerequisites. What does he say? And we're going to talk about what this means. The falling away must come first. The man of sin, the son of perdition, who opposes himself against God, exalts himself as if he's God, sits in the temple, saying, hey, I'm, hey, I'm God. He's talking about the Antichrist. Okay. If you knew nothing about the end of the age, nothing at all, and you read this, does this sound like Christians are supposed to be present when the Antichrist reveals himself mm -hmm. on the earth? Yeah. In the pre-tribulation rapture, you're out of here already. They have all sorts of reasons to tell you you're already gone when that happens. But you would never conclude that if you just took face value some of these, these very important things. But we're going, to show, we're going to show the timing. So again, as though the day of the Christ had come and we've been gathered together to him, don't be fooled. Be like it's happened already because these things must happen first. Call them legal prerequisites of the second coming. The two he names here, they're not the only two, but he names two here, the great falling away. You might see that in other places spoken of as the great apostasy. Apostasy means you've been faking it. You've been, you've been faking your, right, like wheat and tares. You've been faking it. You're, you're, you're not really part of the truth here. You're an apostate. You're really like, a, you're really like a, somebody who's infiltrated and is acting like, and then it gets exposed. And then, of course, we see the Antichrist being revealed, the, 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 the son of perdition, the man of lawlessness, the man of sin who sits in the temple and says, worship me, I'm God, Gavin Newsom. Oh, sorry, did I say that out loud? <laughs> yes. By the way, you know, no, he's not the Antichrist. He's not, because I don't think he'll be able to fool enough Christians. But I would say this, that personality, a person who can look at the camera and lie so easily and look so good doing it and be so certain that everybody believes him, and he believes his own lie himself. No, doesn't even have to believe his lie himself to look like he's telling the truth. That personality, that's what it's gonna be like. So, so again, back when we, we, let we, so we're gonna spend some time, this is what we're gonna do, okay? I have to apologize in advance because the only way to, to write this study and it not be two hours long is for me to ignore, which I don't usually do, ignore reading certain Bible verses. I'm going to refer to the Bible verses. You're watching online. Open your Bible. Look it up. And so I'm going to refer to some the, the passages I'm drawing the conclusions from, and I'm just going to, I'm going to steamroll through them just so you can see them. Again, if you want to elaborate on these in detail, 
go to the Matthew 24 teaching on our website and you can see line by line everything. We just can't really do that in, in a study that's a Saturday morning, right? Mm -hmm. And so that, that again, that, that message is called prophetic education. So we're going to touch the high points, mostly so you can see the consistency of the timing and the prerequisites of the second coming of the Lord and the rapture of the church, okay? So the first reference point is Matthew 24, 3 to 13. Again, we're not going to read it. That's very odd for our technique here, right? We're not going to read it. But let's say, what are the signs you should be looking for? They say, hey, what should we be looking for? That's what the disciples ask him. And they want indicators of, the, of his return and this destruction of the temple. And he gives them a view. He gives them a sermon, which is an overview of the end of the age. And the first thing he says is this. Make sure no one deceives you about the end of the age. See, bad eschatology, study of the end of the age, study of prophetic events, the order of prophetic events, is is ripe in the church. Loaded. Bad doctrines are loaded into Christian theology all over the place about end times. Many of them, many of them have an, a, a, um, an inflection point in their entire theology built on when the rapture takes place. That's the thing. When are we going to get whisked out of here? That's the thing that's the main thing. Can I just tell you, that's not the main thing. <laughs> that is not the main thing. And, and, even, and then this study is not intended to put a deep dive into each of these things, but I'm going to give you some of the main ones you'll hear about, the names of them. Pre-tribulation rapture, probably the most common today, probably the most common today because it's the easiest one to stomach. We're not going to be here. We'll be watching from a balcony in heaven. Mid-tribulation rapture. Post-tribulation rapture, pre-wrath rapture, amillennial belief system. There's no rapture, um, or there's no millennial kingdom, or there's no rapture at all, okay? Now, I'm going to tell you, to give you some reasons why there's errors in these positions, I'm no expert on the end of the age, right? I couldn't even, I could probably study all those and tell you why I think they're wrong, um, and I could certainly tell you why I believe what I believe, but there's people that study every detail. They have charts. They got the days counted from Daniel. They got weeks and years, and they have mathematics, and they have all these kind of things. And that's not my calling. And I'm not against somebody doing that, nor are you learning from somebody that does that. But I'm going to tell you this. The, the things that are missing in most of these models, the key elements, um, is what I want to touch on. And the thing that's most important for you is to be able to recognize what's authentic. I don't think, again, if you're called to this, study it all you want. You want to become an expert on these things? Do it. Absolutely do it. But the first thing you should become an expert on is what the real thing looks like. And that's, isn't that what they do in the banks when they train people to spot counterfeit dollars, counterfeit hundreds? They have to become experts in the real, and as soon as a fake one comes across, they go, that's not real. There may be 50 different samples of counterfeit $100 bills, but they don't have to study 50 samples. They just have to study the real one, and then they can tell. And by the way, when I studied radiology, and chiropractors have lots of radiological training, second only as a general physician to um, medical radiologists because x-rays are such a part of the chiropractic diagnostic tool, more so than regular doctors. They don't use, they have to do x-rays, but they don't do it regularly like chiropractors. We studied normal, 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 normal. We spend a, a couple of years studying normal x-rays. So as soon as you see a not normal x-ray, it glows bright, boom, something wrong there. Now you can get into the nitty gritty. What is that? Is that a bone tumor? Is that arthritis? Is that, is that a soft tissue swelling? Is that a, this or that? Is that a fracture? You can figure those things out. But first, you have to be able to see the, see the, the abnormal because you're so familiar with the normal, the, 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 you know, what's right. Um, so here's the key elements to become an expert in the normal. The parts that are generally missing in all these other models. 
for historical reasons we won't go into today. Number one, your model needs to be Torah-centric. It needs to draw patterns of prophecy from the narratives of the Torah. For instance, the story of Joseph. Key prophetic figure for the end of the age, not considered in any of those other models. Zero. Doesn't have any, doesn't have a single um, storyline. <coughs> Number two, you have to take into consideration the biblical feast cycle, which is God's prophetic time calendar, his prophetic clock for history. None of them do that. You have to take into consideration the super patterns that govern the entire body, a Bible, like the journey and the destination, the story of the Exodus, captivity, wilderness, promised land, birth to adulthood, infancy to maturity. The patterns that you see consistently in the Bible shows a progression of spiritual development and church development, the development of God's people, equivalent to how humans develop from birth to adulthood. It's a pattern. Sinner to saint. And timeline predictors that focus on external events in the world, which is what these do. Antichrist, wars, rumors of wars, peace treaties in Israel, these big ticket items, which will be very important at some point in time. But they're not the key indicators to be looking for now. The most important thing to be looking for now is Christ-like transformation of God's people. God, the church growing up. So if you don't have a church growing up piece in your prophetic model, it's broken. It won't work. All of them take on this do-it-to-me medical approach. Just give me a drug, I'll be transformed. I'll be healed. Jesus will do it. Jesus is going to come back and fix anything, everything. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says he's waiting in heaven until the restoration of all things. That's our job. He left us here to complete his ministry. That is consistent with the New Testament message. In Matthew 24, and that's that part that we're in, right? I'm not reading it, but I'm telling you about it. He continues with the topic about deception, about the end of the age. Many people are going to be fooled by frauds who say, well, I'm the Messiah. There'll be international conflicts, large scale and small. Many more threats of conflicts. This must happen, but don't worry, we're not there yet. That's what he says. There'll be food shortages, crop destruction, plagues, earthquakes. These are just the beginnings of sad times. In Hebrews 12, 25 to, 7, 25 to 27, it says, everything that can be shaken will be shaken, right? Those who follow Yeshua will face trials and persecution. They'll be handed over for execution. They'll be hated all over the world because they identify with the name of Yeshua. And here's where the connection starts happening to what he said, what he's, we're going to see here in 2 Thessalonians. Many so-called followers will be, become insulted by how the world views Christianity and they will ultimately want no part of it. Can I just tell you something? If you ever come to the point in your life where you want no part of Yeshua, it's because you never had any part of Yeshua. The great apostasy is, we think we have Jesus, we're faking we have Jesus, um, we act like we have Jesus, but we never did. And that's called the great falling away. It's the great separation that says, look, these were all fakes. They were faking it. The, bad th the worst thing about the fakes is they become the worst enemies of Christians, right? They turn on the true Christians because in reality they detest everything that the true faith represents and what it requires. They despise all those who hold to the fundamental, inflexible, uncompromising principles. So if people hate you for who you are, you're doing a good job. <laughs> and the reason is they were never Christians. They were cultural. Christians. Maybe we could call that a new religion. Cultural, Cultural Christianity. Other than erroneously containing Christian in its description, it's not Christian at all. It encompasses all people, movements, local and national churches, church brands and their charismatic leaders, 
All who are part of the false gospel light, G-rated entertainment, tent meeting revival, feel good, self-help, inspirational speaker, prosperity gospel, God is your personal genie in the bottle. Don't talk about sin and repentance because you will make people feel bad and we will lose members. Church. That church. <laughs> that church. That church. By the way, this is not the church. That's in here. Yeah. That, th this is not the church because the church is the body of Christ. Mm. And, but, you know, I'm sorry that that's what your generation is experiencing so much of when you look around. Church has become a corporate building structure that you can build real fast if you have certain techniques Worship. and certain things that attract many people. And what doesn't attract many people is hard messages about sin and repentance and living like Christ and dying to yourself. That doesn't attract masses. Back to Matthew 24. False prophets and pseudo-pastors without any true prophetic oversight have dominated the church for centuries and are easily fooled, and they fool others easily. The true love of God will be missing from fake Christians and the lawless church. However, those who are elevated, uh, evaluated at the end, who turn out to be authentic Christians, are the ones who are really saved. <clears throat> There's the first 13 verses. Then in Matthew 14, 24, 14, he says something about the end and the gospel of the kingdom. You see, in order for the end to come, the gospel of the kingdom must be preached to the whole world. That, that serves as a distinguishing testimony of the true, true, mature, and prepared church. Meaning, if the end can't come, until the gospel of the kingdom is preached, how can the end come if Christians can't even define the gospel of the kingdom? They can't preach it, they can't share it, because worldwide Christians and leaders will tell you the gospel of the kingdom is that Jesus died on the cross and you can be saved because he loves you. That's not the gospel of the kingdom. That's the gospel of salvation. Of course you can't have anything without that. I'm not diminishing that. Of course not. You're not a Christian unless you have that. This whole conversation is irrelevant if you're not a born-again Christian. But that's the beginning of the game. That's the born-again. That's becoming an infant. Becoming mature is the gospel of, of, of the kingdom. And, and by the way, let's say we can get that defined. Then don't you think we must define the end? And the average Christian is not going to get that right. And here we are again today. I can go off on a tangent, teach you that entire thing. We're not doing a Matthew 24 sermon today. I'm not going to do that. I refer you back to the prophetic education message from Matthew 24 and 25, and you get an in-depth teaching. What is the gospel of the kingdom? What is the end? Again, I'd love to do it here, but this just offers, it's almost like he wrote an outline here in 2 Thessalonians, and if I take every tangent, we'll just be here for, for days. But the links are here. You can follow these notes when they're online and just go click, 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 and you'll see it. The next part up in Matthew 24, again, we're staying in Matthew 24, not reading it, talking about it, is the 25th to 28th verse with the emphasis on the Great Tribulation. Ha! The thing that the pre-tribulation pre -tribulation rapture belief system says you will not be here for. You will not be here for this. So you have to have some prophetic discernment. He starts saying, if anybody says to you, look over there, it's Christ, or over there, don't believe it. That's what Jesus is saying, don't believe it, don't be fooled. See, I've told you beforehand. He reminds them now as he goes back, right, these are one of these parentheses, go back and give you a reminder of the end of the age of events. First is a reference to the prophecy of Daniel, it refers to the end and the takeover of the Jewish temple service by the Antichrist with pagan practices, the very thing that Paul, Paul is referring to in 2 Thessalonians. Yeshua mentions it. He's referring to the prophecy of Daniel 9, where it says, you know, after 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. Back then, when he got killed in the first century. But not for himself, but for the people, the prince who has come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with flood until the end of the war of desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant for many, for one week. But in the middle of the week, he'll she bring an or a sacrifice of offering, and on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation, 
which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. So referring to the Antichrist coming in and desecrating the temple is what he's referring to in Matthew 24. It's what Paul is referring to in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. During that time, Christians, that would be you, um, flee, get out of the way. Don't get in the light, don't get, a, don't get in the way of this conflict that's about to go on. Because the Antichrist is going to be raging. The devil appointed the Antichrist, and it's going to be he's going to be raging because they know their end is coming. Well, certainly the devil does, right? That time in history will be the greatest persecution. He, he could say to the Thessalonians, what you're facing now is nothing. If you're alive when that happens, that's going to be real persecution, right? Yeah. It'll be known as the Great Tribulation. And, and you can look, you can use this if you're doing a real end time study. Take the book of Daniel, take the book of Revelation, take Matthew 24, take 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, take these other pieces here and there, and you start putting these pieces together. Um, but know this, what you're going to see happening, and you extrapolate from Matthew 24, it corresponds, um, it corresponds with Revelation. Revelation is the last seven year period, and Matthew 24 is giving us a timeline of a period of tribulation and a period after the tribulation towards the end of Matthew 24 when it talks about Joseph who interpreted two seven-year periods. Again, not for today. You can, go, you can go listen to that. But if God did not supernaturally intervene in this tribulatory period, no one would survive, not even, not even a Christian. Not even a Christian. So this is what he says. Um, you're going to escape. Don't take anything with you. Bolt to safety. Don't go back into your house and retrieve anything. Don't go back to change your clothes. It's going to be more difficult for those that are pregnant and nursing. That makes sense, right, if you're on the run. It's going to be more difficult if you have to escape on the Sabbath because nobody's really prepared to do anything. Look at us. We're leisurely hanging out, doing a Bible study. Yeah. We're not ready to go anywhere, right? If you were in full-on rest mode. In the time of panic, it's going to be very tempting to look to anyone who can save you. And false Christs and prophets are going to be springing up everywhere. I got your answer. Follow me. It's going to be tempting. There's going to be convincing, persuasive words. Seemingly supernatural capabilities. Others will try to convince you. They're real. Go with them. I'm going. Come with me. Yeshua says, don't buy in. They'll seem leg legit. They'll seem legit. They'll seem so legit that even Christians might be, real Christians will be tempted to say, is it really them? Is it really the one? And that's why he's warning you ahead of time. Trust me, he says, when I return, when I return, it will look very specific. There's very specific things you have to see that will have taken place. And if they haven't occurred yet, then those false prophets and false pastors and false priests that are out there, you'll know they're fake because you understand what the real looks like. No matter what it looks like, if the prerequisites haven't happened, it's not me. Right? So, and he's going to go through this. The gospel of the kingdom will have to have been preached to the whole world. Right? If right now some antichrist showed up and said, oh, the world's in chaos, follow me. Looks like Jesus doing miracles. If you had in your list, where's Elijah? Where's the restoration? Where's, where's the gospel of the kingdom? Where's this? Where's this? You can't possibly be that person. I don't care what you look like or what kind of miracles you're doing. So, that, that little, we're not going to go into it today, but one of those especially is the, this, um, this prerequisite that Elijah has to come first as a, as a forerunner before Christ comes. And we see that in Malachi 4, 
it says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming and grateful, dreadful day of the Lord, and he will. And it talks about the Elijah ministry. Again, not for today, but just know that's a prerequisite. Elijah comes first, before. So if you don't see the Elijah ministry taking place, which is the restoration of all things ministry, a restoration of God's people back towards a garden-like obedience, that's not Christ. And these are just a few clues that will tell you if he's come yet, if it's him. But there's going to be so much bad doctrine around these events over the next 2,000 years that will be increasingly more difficult to sort out. That's why you must be discerning. Then, in Matthew 24, starting in verse 29, he says, then it will look like this. Immediately after, can everybody say after? After. The tribulation of those days. Immediately after, then... He's going to come back. So for all the pre-tribulation fans, I don't know how you jump through this hoop. They do it, and they they twist the things around, but you got to give this up. After the Great Tribulation, it starts describing his return. This is what it'll look like. <coughs> it'll be so dark that there's no light at all. No sun, no moon, no stars. It will be as if nature itself has failed. Then he will break forth in the sky through darkness and his glory will light up the heavens. The Antichrist can't fake that. These false Christ can't fake that. At that moment, every human still alive, whoever denied him, will instantly have regret. Instantly. Then you'll hear the sound of a trumpet. By the way, this is what it says in Matthew 24. And, and then the church gets raptured. And that trumpet blast is, corresponds to the trumpet blast of the Feast of Trumpets, which is the first day of the seventh month on the Hebrew calendar, the blowing of trumpets, corresponding to the blowing of the last trumpet that we can find precisely in the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. And if you can find it precisely in the book of Revelation, you'll notice when I say, if you pull out the parentheses, it comes right before the bowls of wrath which makes perfect sense because as we see in 1 Thessalonians, it says this, um, it says, you're not subjected to God's wrath. And that's this big thing. We won't go through the tribulation because we're not subjected to God's wrath. To which I say, God's wrath is not the tribulation. The great tribulation is persecution of the devil against humans. The wrath of God is the persecution of God against pagans. Seals, trumpets, bowls, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls. The bowls of wrath, the last trumpet before the bowls of wrath is when the rapture takes place. The church is gone and God pours his wrath out on the earth and the church is gone. Right? So in 1 Thessalonians 5 it says, hey, you should know the times and seasons <coughs> because you should understand this feast cycle. That's why. Now, if you're reading the Bible and say, you know, you should know the times and seasons, and you don't know the times and seasons, then you can't possibly know what it's talking about. But if you want details on that, that's good, because we did a teaching on this when we did 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 1 to 11, the hyperlinks in the notes. That is called, you shall know perfectly well. So if you want to study that cycle and how that works together, you can go and, and see that. But the big picture is there is that um, that sudden destruction is going to come on those who don't know the times and seasons. And you, brethren, who are understanding the Lord, do know them, and so it doesn't overtake you like a thief in the night. Right? And that's where it says, um, for God did not appoint us to wrath. That's where they get it from. Right there, I think it's verse 9. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. And, and I stand in agreement with that. He has not. You just have to know where to find that in the Bible and how it corresponds to these, these things, right? And like I said, the, okay, so here it is in Revelation. Ready? You want to mark this down. Revelation 10, 7. 
This is when the last trumpet is blown. But in the sounding of the seventh angel, when it is about, the, about to sound, the mystery of God will be finished as he declared to his servants. That's 10-7. But it's not until 11-15 that it gets blown. He says it's about to blow, then it blows. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there was a loud voice in heaven, and the kingdoms of the world have become the kingdoms of our Lord Jesus Christ, and he shall reign forever. And then you have this little parentheses-like thing, and he says, then look, and behold, a white cloud, and on that cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having his, on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out and said, crying with a loud voice, to him who sat on the cloud. Okay, mind you what's happening here. The trumpet's going to blow. The trumpet does blow. There's some son of man sitting on a cloud, and uh, there's a communication going on, and he's got a sharp sickle in his hand. And what is he going to do? Trust your sickle and reap, for the time of your harvest has come. Reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So all who sat on the cloud, thrust your sickle, to he who sat on the cloud, thrust their sickle, and the earth was reaped. That's the, that's the rapture. See, trumpet, about to blow, trumpet blows, look, this is what it's going to look like. But it doesn't happen here. This is not where it happens. This is what he tells you where, what it's going to look like. Because it's not till chapter uh, 16 that, let's see, hold on a second, let's see. So he says, okay, let me actually show you this. If you go into first Thess uh, um so Matthew 24 talks about the last trumpet, and in 1 Corinthians 15 and 50, it says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkle of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised and corruptible, and, and we shall be changed. Right? Relating to God has not appointed us to wrath. Right? It's not until chapter 16. So right in between chapter 16, all the way in chapter 16 now, the, the mystery is ended in chapter 10. Then the trumpet goes in the next chapter. And it's not until chapter 16, with all in between, that the first bowl of wrath is poured out. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, go and pour out the bowls of wrath on God, of God on the earth, right? The, the church is not there for that. The rapture has taken place. Ooh. To me, this all lines up perfectly. This makes perfect sense as it, as it lines up. And perfect sense with what he's saying now. So now, I need somebody to go back in and read the last verses of today, verses five to 12, which is the shorter part of our study. It's um, much less heady, so we're actually closer to the end of the beginning. So whoever gets there, we're going to be in 2 Thessalonians 2, 5 to 12. We'll read that all together, and then we'll, hand that in a, we'll handle that in a couple of sections. It should all be making sense now. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time, for that the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteousness deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they may be saved that they might be saved and for this reason God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness mm, yummy okay <laughs> let's handle yummy. verses 5 to 8 let's talk about what is restraining what is restraining the Antichrist from being revealed? Okay? It wasn't on. How, why not? I had a feeling. 
No, it, you can't see it. Let me see. Hello, it's on. It's on. You just can't see it. Yeah, it goes blank. It goes blank. You can't see it in the daytime. It's on. That's okay. That's good. No, it's good. It's good to notice those things. Hey, listen, we've recorded entire messages with with bad mics. So I'd rather have a little glitch with double checking than uh, than nothing. Okay, so here's the deal. Um, what is restraining? There's some controversy here. I don't want to. Some people said it's the Archangel Gabriel. Some people say it's the Holy Spirit. If you look at the way, if you're reading the New King James Version, it's the way version, the way <coughs> the pronouns, can you say pronouns? Mm -hmm. The way pronouns are capitalized, he says he, he takes, he takes he, him out of the way. Yeah. Meaning God takes the Holy Spirit out of the way who is currently restraining the Antichrist from revealing. It's not a terrible thought, right? Now, I could agree with that. I'm not 100% sure I would say it's the angel Gabriel. I think the pre-wrath rapture version of the Christ says that, of a, a pre-wrath rapture version of the end of the age says that. But I would say, um, either way, the problem is that theories like the pre-trib rapture, when they say the Holy Spirit gets taken out of the way, they're saying the Holy Spirit gets taken out of the way and that's the equivalent of the rapture, because if there's no Holy Spirit, that means all the Christians are gone. So if that has to happen before the Antichrist can be revealed, then by virtue of this, the rapture has to take place after the Holy Spirit's removed, so the Antichrist can get revealed, and that only happens because there's no Christians left on the planet. Okay, first of all, I don't think it has to mean that. It just means that the Holy Spirit, who does nothing except for what the Father tells her, we could say that, the feminine part of God, to do, he says, the time is now, release the hounds. Let the Antichrist loose. I think that's more like what we're, we're seeing here. So the proper time comes when, when the enemy is about to make his last stand, and the enemy, the devil, has to raise up the Antichrist, and God says, okay, go. It's time. Right? He's going to let out this wild animal, and then he's going to destroy it all. Right? In 1 John, I think this is what you were referring to when you were showing me the little scripture on your, your phone. 1 John 2, 18 and 19. Little children, in the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, and even now many Antichrists have come, mm -hmm. by which you know that it is the last hour, they went out from us, but they're not of us. For if they had been from us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. This is this great falling away concept. So what's happening is they're pretending to be Christians, but they're not. And when things, get, when things heat up, they disappear, and it's because they never were part of the, the fold in the first place. Right? And the difference between the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness, the specific figure, and the Antichrist spirit is determined here. The Antichrist spirit has existed from, from ever, forever. Right? Danny, Daniel's talking about it. <coughs> we see it here in the first century when John's talking about it in 1 John. It's a spirit that denies Christ. Mm -hmm. It's an Antichrist spirit. Um, but the Antichrist is, is coming. Anybody deceiving, it says in 2 John 1, 7, for many deceivers have gone out into the world who did not confess Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an Antichrist. An Antichrist. Not the Antichrist, not the person. It's a, per, it's, a, it's a spirit already active in the world, but the Antichrist will not rise until God allows it by taking the restrainer out of the way. Let's say for our purposes today, the Holy Spirit is directed to release that, let the hounds go. What happens? This mystery of lawlessness. This is a big theme. Maybe off camera we can discuss this idea in detail. But, but if you trace every wrong institution, if you look at all the institutions of the earth that have gotten it wrong, maybe even purposely gotten it wrong, medicine, banking, education, government, religion, all of them have one common theme, lawlessness. Medicine, let's ignore how the body works just do something else. 
violate the law of the human body, invade the body in a lawless fashion. Government, need I say more? <laughs> the church, today. Not everyone says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does my will, the will of the Father. Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Cast out demons in your name? Done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Knew you. Depart from me, you who work lawlessness. A lawless church. Those against the laws of God. Grace has negated law. It's everywhere. The Greasy Grace Church. Right? Um, so we have, got, and that, yeah, so medicine, government, banking. Do you know we have a fiat money system? You know what fiat means? Fake. Fake. It's lawless. The money system in our country is against the Constitution of the United States. It's a lawless thing. So everything fake. Lawlessness is the root of all sin here, right? Lawlessness is sin, right? Exactly, because that's what it says, right? Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness, right? First John 3, 4. But in the last days, perilous times will come when men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power of. And from such power turn away. Because they can't understand godliness, because godliness is seeking after God. They're, they're making up their own religion. It's just a way of, it's like, it's like saying, it's like looking at the camera and saying, the border is closed <laughs> with a straight face. That's what it's like. All these things are the exact opposite of chasing God, and they're, and they're thinking they're godly. Their form of godliness is following their own God. They know nothing about God. That's 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5. In 1 Timothy 4, starting 1, it says, The Spirit expressly says in latter times, Some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. That's what the end of the age looks like. Back to 2 Thessalonians, and we go all the way to 9 and 10, chapter 2, and then it talks about the coming of this lawless one is according to the work of Satan. See, we're going to see this happen. We're going to see it in the Revelation. With all power and signs and lying wonders, with all unrighteous deception among those who, per who perish because they do not receive in love of the truth, that they may be saved. See, like it said, we didn't read these verses in Matthew 24. We talked about it, but let me read them now, just a few. Then if anyone says to you, look here is the Christ, or there do not believe it, false Christ and fake prophets will rise up with great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Verses 23 and 24. And you see what it says here in uh, 2 Thessalonians 2.9, the coming of the lawless one is according to the work of Satan. Ready? Let's find where that happens. Uh, Revelation 13. Let's, let me let somebody else read this, because we're almost done. I could take a break. If you could turn your Bibles to Revelation 13, and starting in verse 11. Whoever's got the mic, you can take it on. Are you there? Oh, you got it, Katie? 13, 11? Yeah. You're going to see how the coming of the Antichrist is, is the work of Satan. Just, just 11? Or? Nope, start at 11. Go all the way to, I'll stop you. Okay. Then I, the end. I think it's the end. Yeah, go ahead. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by the who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was he was granted to do in the sight of the beast see the picture the great signs that he's granted to do keep going 
telling who telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. So you can see that's the story of the Antichrist being empowered by the devil to do his ministry on the earth, his ministry, right? Like we'll end this area his with these two verses. Everything we just learned, Paul loves to say, and for this reason, God will send them strong delusions that they should believe the lie. And they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Verses 11 and 12. See, there's this thing about desiring to be deceived, desiring to have illusions, delusions, believing lies, um, seeking pleasure in unrighteousness. The MO is that God eventually hands those over who insist on sins to their sinful passions. In the end, this has been happening forever, but in the end it happens in mass numbers. It's called the great falling away. You want to see some samples of it? Read three verses in Romans 1, 24, 26, and 28. Therefore God, listen, they're insisting on sin. Therefore God also gave them up to the uncleanness of the lust of their hearts to the sign of their bodies amongst themselves. Verse 26, for this reason, God gave them up to their vile passions, for even their women exchanged natural use once against nature. Verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do things which are not fair. So that's what happens. Now when that happens with hundreds of millions of people at the same time who claim they were Christians, that's the great falling away. If we were in a megachurch right now, I would say, look to your left, look to your right. Both of them won't be there when you, uh... <laughs> I wouldn't say what. Well, anyway, I don't know that. And then circle back around, right? And to be clear, Yeshua's second coming will not occur until all these things have taken place, right? So that day will not come unless the great falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, right? So this is just to put a timing on it. Okay. So we're going to close there today. Whew. Next time we're together, next time I'm teaching, um, we're going to jump into just the last part of this chapter. It's just the last uh, few verses, 13 to 17, in a message likely to be called Obtaining Glory. Nice. And um, the f teaching after that, I believe, if I'm looking ahead, probably handle the entire chapter 3. doesn't seem like it's difficult to handle in one setting. So we will see you next time. Yeah. Thank you, Doctor.